Hi, everyone. Thank you for attending today's webinar, the 2024 Leadership Wish List. My name is Ann Parker, and I'm Associate Director of Talent Leader Consortiums at ATD. I'm pleased to be moderating today's webinar for TD leaders. You can find more resources for talent development leaders at www.td.org backslash TDL. And I would like to start us off today by introducing and thanking our sponsor. Sounding Board empowers forward-thinking companies to bridge leadership gaps at all levels. They ensure that both organizations and employees thrive in a global marketplace marked by disruption and continuous change. Sounding Board offers the modern tech-led way to drive leadership development in a volatile world. They're dynamic, people-focused, and connected to the business outcomes you care about most. Join their people-first partners like Intel, EY, and Cloudera as they chart a new path forward, reimagining how companies should invest in talent to bridge today's leadership gaps and shape the leaders of tomorrow. You can learn more at www.soundingboardinc.com, and I will share that link in the chat as well. And before we begin, I'd like to introduce our presenters as well. Christine Cow is the co-founder and CEO of Sounding Board. Before founding Sounding Board in 2016, Christine enjoyed several roles in Silicon Valley, including at Google, YouTube, Tapjoy, and other startups. She holds an MBA in marketing and operations from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and a BA in, in business administration from the University of California, Berkeley. In addition to advising several startups, Christine is an angel investor and a fellow at the Tory Burch Foundation. She was named to the EY Entrepreneurial Winning Women Class of 2021 and was awarded a 2021 Stevie Award for Women in Business. Rebecca Stern is the Director of Leadership and Organizational Development at Udemy. She leads the strategic design of learning and organizational processes and solutions, which help Udemy achieve its mission of improving lives through learning. Passionate about the future of learning, she experiments and learns fast about what can work in today's hybrid context. She has worked in diverse company contexts, including global internal and external consulting roles, startups, and larger multinational companies. We've got two dynamic people with us today to lead this presentation. Super excited to dive in. So with that, I'll turn it over to Christine and Rebecca. Thank you so much, Anne, and excited to be here. Hi, Rebecca. How are you? Hi, Christine. I'm so happy to be here with you. And I'm in your hometown of uh, California, San Francisco. I know we still have bright sun shine outside, although I will say my feet were getting colder in the last week or so. <laughs> yeah, yes. Awesome. Sure. Well, um, I just want to first welcome everyone. And um, Rebecca and I have been busy preparing for today um, because we know that many of you, ourselves included, are deep in planning for next year. You know, and you're thinking about as you're designing your learning programs and your leader programs, how and what types of trends should be very carefully considered to be part of that wish list, especially as it relates to leadership development. And so that's really what we're here to talk about today. Um, Rebecca has some amazing data and insights from um, her time as both a practitioner of someone leading and delivering these solutions internally at Udemy, but of course also being um, a platform that is delivering learning solutions to global learners around the world. Um, and myself at Sounding Board, we work with thousands of leaders every day to help them up-level their leadership. And so we're also seeing a lot of patterns that have emerged, particularly in the last year, that we think will be really helpful for you to consider as you think about what you can build into your programming for next year. Anything you would add to that, Rebecca? I think that's a perfect capture. Awesome. Well, look, we decided that, you know, one, um, we will jump right into it. And so, cause we have a lot of content and a lot of insights and we also wanna have some conversation with all of you. So what we're hoping that you get out of the session today is one clear recognition of some of the incoming trends for leadership development that should be on your wish list. Um, one of them, and I'll sort of give away the um, answer now is 
really exploring the role of coaching in leadership development, because that's one of the trends that emerged for us. Um, and then we hope that we can actually demystify a bit of how to actually develop these given the environment that we're in. And so we'll just go right to the end, which is, so what should make your leadership whistlish? And we actually tried to keep it very simple. Um, these three things are things that you probably have seen on a lot of lists around trends across learning, which is around skills, the importance of technology, and in particular, AI. Um, and another one, um, which is a big focus for us and a lens we'll use today, is then the role of leadership development um, throughout those uh, those programs and those trends. Um, but that's it. You know, we've already given away the goods, but hopefully you'll still stay and be able to understand like, well, how did we get to this? And so actually I'll hand it over to Rebecca to kick us off there. Yeah, sure, Christine. So um, I'm really happy to talk about the first one, uh, which is all about skills. And um, if you've read any publications lately or looked at any articles online, uh, everyone is talking about skills, skills, skills. And uh, this transformation towards becoming a skills-based organization is really front and center of um, what a lot of learning leaders, a lot of talent leaders, a lot of CEOs are thinking about. Um, <clears throat> there was a great study done by Deloitte that looked at uh, you know, who is experimenting with a skills-based approach and really covered skills-based organizations. And they found that 90% of executives are actively experimenting with skills-based approaches. Uh, that's an enormous amount of executives that are currently uh, experimenting with that. There's another study from the World Economic Forum that found that worker skills are going to be disrupted in the next five years. So 44% of worker skills will be disrupted. Um, and then in that same um, Deloitte study, they also said that uh, found that 89% of executives are saying that skills are important for how we define work, how we deploy talent in the future. But um, while everyone's talking about skills, uh, what we're also seeing at the same time is that fewer than one in uh, fewer than one in five companies are adopting a skills-based approach to a significant extent. 10% uh, of organizations are using a skills taxonomy to classify skills, and 10% of executives strongly agree that they can anticipate skills needed in the future. So it paints this picture of a lot of people experimenting with skills and talking about skills-based approaches, but very few are actually have made that transformation happen and have made it, uh, you know, have done that successfully. In that same Deloitte study, they also looked at early adopters, uh, so folks who have made the switch, and there was some pretty impressive data in there, um, you know, like 107% more likely to place talent effectively, 89% um, more, effect, uh, more likely to retain high performers. Those, I, I don't know about you, but I know for me and Christine, I'm sure you too, like, that's some of our big goals are to retain high performers, to place talent effectively. Uh, so there, there seems to be a lot of benefits from uh, this transformation that's underway. Yeah, and I think what you know we talked about was it feels like this is the thing that people are really putting at the forefront of how they're thinking about designing solutions, but yet there's this gap that needs to be closed to actually make that a reality. Mm -hmm. um, and and I think you've done some interesting work here, so I'll let you keep going. <laughs> there is a gap. I mean, that's a great way to put it. Um, uh, you know, this transformation is going to take a big mindset shift. And so when we think about the leaders in our organizations, like what does that mindset shift look like? Well, it's really moving from a place where um, they're used to having jobs first and they're moving to skills first. Excuse me. Um, and so, um, you know, I love that first uh, that first line where that mentality of we need people that can fill these jobs yeah. in a skills based organization that's really shifting towards we need people who have these skills. And while that it, it, it's a little bit of a nuance, right, skills have always been here. We, we've always worked with skills in terms of talent and leader development. Um, however, they're just becoming more um, to the forefront, right? So jobs as a container are going away. Yep. Skills first approaches are really, um, you know, the future. That's where we're seeing the shift happen. Um, and so we're going to have to help our leaders, right, next year really start to make this shift from um, a job mentality to a skills mentality. 
you know, Christine, I'm curious, uh, you know, from your perspective, is are there one of these shifts on this list that really resonate with you or um, with the customers that you work with on a daily basis? I do think this, um, like you said, it's nuanced, right? Because you're like, well, what really is the difference between saying I need somebody to do this job and I need somebody who has this skill set? Um, I think that what you and I talked about it is that it just starts to break apart where and try to better align need to a skill set versus what we've traditionally done, which is maybe role to a uh, resume or a um, titling or experience. And for both of us, I think we felt like that's also moving to a place of more equity um, in terms of opening up the aperture of thinking about who can actually do this job and focusing on what those skills are versus just thinking about a person. Mm -hmm, for sure. Um, and I think you hit the nail on the head when you said um, it, it's really a shift towards becoming more equitable, more precise, right, about exactly what we need to get the work done. Um, and when you think about, uh, you know, the the reliance on credentials or like the how and where you learned it, right? So what school did you go to? Did you get a master's, you know, um, that educational component? I think that will end up going away and we're going to focus more on can you do it? Uh, which to me is a really exciting shift because uh, from an equitable, uh, from an equity standpoint, right, we're really leveling the playing field and saying, it doesn't really matter how or where you learned it. What really matters is can you do it, right? Do you have the skill to get the work done? And that's super exciting. What I love that about that also is that it's an opportunity, especially for folks in learning to expose and have a conversation around the programs that they're designing Mm -hmm. To really get at like the heart of, well, what's the challenge or what's the need that you have? And that is always something that drives, I think, better alignment between the business partners and um, your learning, you know, um, center, say, um, to make sure that the things that you're designing and delivering really are at getting to those needs across the organization, right? Because mm -hmm. just asking someone, well, is this a program for X versus what's the need that you have and what capabilities are you wanting to develop? I feel that invites a different conversation. Yeah, I completely agree. It really does invite a different conversation. Um, and you talked about this concept of alignment, right, across the organization and um, what we're, so at Udemy, we're on this journey, right? We're, we're aiming, our goal is to become a skills-based organization um, and uh, I wanted to share with um, you and with the rest of the group today, um, the framework that we're really using uh, to guide us along that journey, because when we first started kicking off um, this idea of becoming a skills-based organization, the path felt really muddy. Like it, it wasn't very clear to us. And uh, there's not many, many organizations that are leading the way saying like, this is how you do it. And this is step one. And so for us, you know, we- And you're a learning company, right? right. So that's right. just amazing for you to also just admit and share that with folks that like, hey, even the folks that are expert leading innovation around this are trying to translate that to their own organizations. I love that. Oh, for sure. I mean, um, I'm all about keeping it real, right? And um, <laughs> we we are, um, we're definitely on this journey, right? So what we did internally was uh, we went ahead and said, what are some of the dimensions that we need to pay attention to? And for us, it was these four things. Um, uh, you know, our skills integrated into the business strategy, there was a really interesting study that was done um, by BCG where they looked at uh, what, uh, how many times does skills show up in investor materials mm -hmm. um, and ESG reports. And what was so interesting was that only about 25% of companies had skills show up at that level. And they so what that tells you, right, is a very small amount of companies are really communicating to their investors, to the external market, what skills are important for them to achieve their strategy. And so for us, it was about really integrating skills into our business strategy, right? Like identifying what are those skills that we're going to need to get to where we want to go in the future. 
Um, and so that was the first one. Um, the second one for us was around skill strategy and governance, right? So this cannot just be an HR initiative. It has to be a whole business initiative. It has to be something that we as a company really want to do. And from that alignment piece you were talking about, Christine, like it was very important to us that if we were truly leading in a skills-based organization, we would have a unified skill strategy and we would have broad stakeholder engagement, right? We'd have a lot, all the people on the bus heading in the same direction. Um, so that was number two for us. The third was technology. Um, we're at such an interesting time um, in tech and, you know, Christine, I know you have a lot of points of view around this too, where, you know, we've had all these systems that have emerged to help us do learning, leadership development, um, HR, talent management really well. And we're finally at the point too, where those systems are talking to one another in a really meaningful way. And so for us, it was also um, moving towards interoperability um, and achieving that vision of, you know, having all of our ta talent management software, all of our talent management tech really talk to one another and help us lead the way in a skills-based organization. Yeah. Then lastly, Around personas, you know, this isn't new to us in learning and development. We've been working with personas for a long time. Um, but to us, it was more around really clearly defining persona groups, maybe thinking outside of our normal personas that we go to on a daily basis. And then also, um, you know, differentially prioritizing investments in the personas and the skills that they need that are going to drive our business strategy in the future. Um, and so, uh, you know, these four things, we just, you know, this is our roadmap. This is our framework where we're saying, um, you know, we're going to continue to try and make actions that move us up from establishing to building to scaling to leading. Um, so that's what, that's the journey that we're on. And could you share, is there a specific program or is there a specific initiative that you can share that might illustrate this, like how this actually came to life, um, you know, for some of the programs that you were running? Yeah, I mean, I, I think even apart from just like a program that we're running, um, it's part of our uh, it's part of our company objectives for next year. You know, oh, so on an enterprise level, um, we're we're you know committing to becoming a skills based organization. So we've really taken it, uh, you know, in that second line, we've really gone beyond HR and beyond just talent, and really have embraced as a company, which to me is such an exciting place to be. Yeah. Uh, to say like we're we're committing to this transformation as a whole, and. I won't put you on the spot. I will also try to answer this too. But one of the questions in the chat was, um, I thought very interesting, you know, Simona talked about, well, how do you then navigate this conversation and expectation around like, well, that's not my job, you know, or I'm not paid to do that versus can you do it? Um, and even this thought of, you know, can we ask people to do it because they can, how much of that needs to live in your job description but I like that question because it actually gets at the heart of some of the ongoing um, challenges and things that people are thinking through as they think about a skills-based organization. Yeah. And you know what's so funny about, um, I love that question too, because it really gets to the heart of change. Um, and oftentimes change for us is really hard, right? As humans, we're not great at change. Um, uh, you know, there are there's folks that do change management so well. And, and uh, from like colleagues and experiences that I've personally had around change, what I've learned is that um, you have to really, you can say all the benefits you want about becoming a skills-based organization or insert any other transformation that you're after. But you also have to help people understand what is the risk of not changing, mm. right? So continuing to do what you're doing, like what is the risk of staying at that status quo? So the benefits alone may not actually drive people to make that decision, but actually what's keeping them in their status quo is the fear of loss, right? The fear of losing something that they have today. Um, and so I, I would challenge all of us too, as, as uh, you know, change practitioners in some way, shape or form, uh, mm -hmm. to look at how we're getting people on board. How are you influencing people to be part of this transformation, part of this change? 
And are you just, you know, listing a list of benefits or are you truly getting at the heart of that fear that's holding them back or what are, what's at risk for them to lose? I think that's a really um, important insight. Um, and then I will also say more from a um, broader organizational level is this is why the skills conversation influences every part of the employee life cycle, right? From um, recruiting and your job descriptions, how you think about how you're bringing in talent all the way through job scoping. And the more that you can bring those skills and capabilities into every step of that life cycle for the employee, the more that you just start to bring this awareness, I think, to folks that it's um, the job title may be similar, but we're being very clear around what are those broader skills and capabilities that actually fit under that, that you may not have understood to be important or critical to that job. Would you yeah. agree? Totally. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Um, well, one of the things that I was really struck with when I saw this framework that you shared around a skills-based organization was, you know, how does this relate to leadership development programs? And um, certainly what we've observed at Sounding Board is that companies are definitely, like you said, varied along where they are along this framework and path. Um, I'd say similar to what you shared around skill strategy and governance that more organizations are in the earlier stages where we actually see a lot of maturity is actually in the last row around personas um, because you know traditional programs really have been developed for leader development very much around cohort models or mm -hmm. um, user groups or types right if you're talking about executive, hypos, first-time managers, frontline managers. So we do see that a lot of companies have spent a lot of time clearly defining the personas, but I think the lens you're bringing is, is don't forget it's not just a persona. Like make sure you're layering on this lens of within that persona. What are those skill strategies, right? And taking the time to then bridge those to the business strategy. Yeah. Um, the one thing I thought was interesting also about technology is that Technology is mixed, and we'll talk to this later because technology changes very quickly, right? And so, on one hand, I think it's been very widely adopted. You know, even you to me, I took a look. You have almost a thousand courses just under the leadership and management category in Udemy for Business. So, companies are understanding that when it comes to self learning or self initiated learning or content they're making available. There has to be a component of that that includes access to leadership development and management as part of that because people are trying to utilize that to help them solve situations or skills that they feel like they have a gap around. But where we see more of a gap is actually back to these more traditional programs where a lot of those previously were designed in maybe more of a training format or maybe Prior to the pandemic, we were assuming we'd come together as a group to be able to engage around those. And now we're realizing to make it more equitable, to make it more available and scalable, technology also has to be at the forefront of those experiences where your um, traditional leader programs, I would say. Mm -hmm. Anything you can share on that? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree with that. And I think that the other element I layer on there is um, how are you incorporating technology into the learning too? So, um, you know, I'll use ChatGPT, for example, and I will go there in a bit, yeah. um, but I would even, you know, ask you to reflect on, you know, how are you using that as um, a core component in your programs, right? Not just to build them and, um, you know, maybe create content for them, but truly having people interact with AI in some way, shape or form as a way to learn. Yeah, agreed. And thank you, everyone. I'm seeing lots of questions in the chat. We will try to get to some of them, but I will move us along and then we'll kind of note these and um, Anne will help us note these so we make sure we get to these in the Q&A. Um, but one of the things I think we wanted to um, lead people with, at least for, as it relates to skills, was a question. So Rebecca, I'll bring it back to you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, uh, you know, feel free to chime in in the chat. Uh, 
we would love to hear from you. You know, how might your leadership programs look different or how might you change them if you apply to skills-based lens or if you're already doing this? Would love to, you know, hear you share about that. Um, you know, I'll share what we're doing at Udemy as as people uh, take a minute and reflect on that question and uh, start to chime in in the chat. Uh, we we redesigned our manager uh, equipping program this year um, and just finished our first pilot of it, which is a super exciting place to be. And we uh, we realized in our old version that we weren't making skills the forefront. You know, so we really mm -hmm. took a concerted effort to put the skills first and front and center. And through that design, that redesign of that program, another thing we kind of stumbled upon was this idea of Lego blocks, right? So to your point, because things are changing so fast, yes. we wanted to design a program where we could um, swap out our Lego blocks rapidly. Uh, you know, so uh, we thought about skills in a way of um, how can you design not for the skill itself, but design an experience where you could essentially slot any skill into it. Uh, and so that was a, a really exciting, I think, um, uh, you know, finding for us through that experiment and through that redesign that has helped us think differently about our leadership program. Was that uh, something around having a broader set of modules that were skill-based that people could self-opt into? Or what did that mean specifically in terms of the experience? Yeah, for us, it means um, creating greater focus because mm -hmm. instead of trying to teach folks how to be a great manager soup to nuts, sure. we said, you know, we looked ahead and said, okay, for this next year, what are going to be the priority skills? What are those skills that we would place our bets on, right? These are the things that are going to differentially impact somebody's ability to be a great manager for the coming year. And that's where we place our bets. And mm -hmm. what we're also you know, considering and acknowledging is that that's probably going to change in the next yeah. six months, you know, given how our macro is so insane right now. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so we wanted to be have a flexible enough program that we could swap things in and out, right? Yeah. and leverage our own content, you know? So uh, Udemy is such a powerhouse because we operate on a marketplace model, which means that as soon as a new technology drops or as soon as a new thing is out there, our instructors are creating courses on that. So that allows us to have really fresh and relevant content very quickly. So then we are able to swap it in and out in the program so that we're continuing to keep our managers exposed to the freshest. Yeah, what I love about that is also something that we've seen that's important um, at Sounding Board and also the customers that we work with is actually just uh, setting the expectation for employees for either programs or learning that you're designing, that there is some fungibility to that, that mm -hmm. what you learn might change. And literally just naming that helps create a bit of a expectation and helps people frame that, oh, right, we do need to adapt as we think about how the world is continuing to evolve. And now we're actually building that flexibility into the system or, you know, to these experiences. And I think that actually just in itself is very powerful. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, the last question we wanted to leave you with also, because Rebecca and I started to ponder down this was, even in addition to how a skills-based lens could impact your programs is what impact would that might even have on your selection for programs um, as you think about designing those? Because a lot of that has previously been role-based, right? And so that was one that we just wanted to put out there and have people noodle on. But I will move us along because we've spent some time also already opening up this topic about technology and technology being important to have at the top of your wish list. And in particular, it's hard to talk about that, I'd say in the past year, without also recognizing the importance of a very specific technology, which is AI. Um, and so Rebecca, you've some great data around why that is important. And so I'll hand it over to you to talk about that. Yeah, um, so you're right. The past year, like if you haven't heard of AI or ChatGPT, um, you've probably been offline for a very long time uh, <laughs> because uh, the end of November really marked the one year anniversary for chat GPT being launched into um, existence uh, in the you know kind of mass mass way. 
And what's so interesting about that too is that um, ChatGPT is is unlike other technologies that have been have emerged because it's affecting every single person in the organization at the exact same time in some type of way, you know, so it's not like a new coding language or something that, you know, comes out from it that might only impact your technology team, but chat GPT is really impacting everyone. Um, so I think quality, qualitatively it's, it's quite different. Um, but I know we want to hear from all of you in terms of, you know, how extensively have you implemented um, Gen AI um, into your leadership development initiatives? Um, so go ahead and take a minute, uh, you know, our scale is kind of fun, right? So not at all, you might be dabbling. Most of your programs cover the topic or you're really leading the way, like your gen, your leaders are gen AI pros. Um, so curious to hear from all of you. And it's incredible to think that it's really only been a year, right? Right. It's insane, right? Just one year ago. And um, now I'm, you know, asking chat GPT to like plan my meals for the week and, uh, help me, you know, write better emails and yeah. like, what my husband, we it? went out to eat, um, dinner at a new restaurant the other day and he plugged in, what should I order here? You know? And it was funny just seeing how people are utilizing it across all facets of their lives. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's, I think it's going to become our best personal assistant that, we always wish we had, and we never knew we could have. Um, so I'm excited to see what it becomes. Okay, so our results are in. Um, so you can see about half the group got it all, um, about 40%, you know, in the dabbling experimenting space. Um, and then we even have a few that are, you know, more leading the way in terms of the programs are covering the topic. That's fantastic. And uh, so there's probably a few people on this call that we want to learn from, right, in terms of how they're how they're incorporating it. Yes, absolutely. That's wonderful. So um, when we think about Gen AI, um, I want to share some data from our platform, right? So uh, if we look back to December 2022, which is really um, when we, uh, you know, ChatGPT launched the last week of November. So we started our, you know, ticker in uh, December 2022. Uh, on our platform, we were uh, proudly the first to have a course on ChatGPT, which is you know something we're super proud of here at Udemy. Uh, we had ten courses by the end of that month, and up until the present day, you know where and this is growing like every minute. It's probably changed already, uh, but we have over twelve hundred courses on um, Gen AI ChatGPT on the platform. We also consistently see enrollments increase, right? So this was one of what we call our surging skills in our last learning trends report. Um, it, you know, uh, last year we had seen almost like a thousand, it was like 4,000% increase. It was insane um, in terms of how many people were out there learning about ChatGPT and Gen AI. Um, and then we have over 57 million minutes of learning that's occurred on the platform around this topic. Uh, so that's, it's pretty incredible, right, to, to see the trend. And so if you aren't yet considering, you know, including Gen AI, ChatGPT into your leadership development programs, I would encourage you to take a serious look at doing so because from the trends that we're seeing in consumption, right, and activity on the platform, it's super clear that people are learning about this, right? So people are curious about it. There's learning that's happening, which means that we should probably look at it ourselves um, <laughs> and plan for that yeah. um, for sure. Uh, you know, we also work with customers, um, you know, clearly every day. Um, and a lot of our customers were coming to us asking about urgent skilling cases, right? So can you help us, you know, X, Y, Z um, in terms of uh, get people up to speed on Gen AI and chat GPT? And what we found is that there were really four major skilling use cases. Um, and we've built learning paths around each of these four. They're available to all of our customers. So if you're a customer today, uh, reach out to your customer success manager and they can help you um, get this live for sure. Um, but if you want to go ahead and just build the slide, Christine, yeah. um, for, you know, the org wide understanding that includes, you know, everything from just, uh, you know, get me, get me up to the baseline, essentially, you know, help me just understand what the Gen AI uh, chat GPT is, what it's about, how I might think about it, how I might apply it across the business. 
for emerging technical acumen, this is really a deeper dive, right? So help me understand it from a technical perspective. Um, you know, how how might I configure the model? What are um, product in innovations that are emerging from this technology? And then we move into like more productivity and role-based skills. Um, so these are, you know, um, depending on where you sit in the organization today, um, what skills you might be, um, you know, using in your everyday job. Uh, it's really a, a pathway that's designed to help you apply ChatGPT in your daily life. You know, so Christine, what we were talking about in the beginning in terms of, you know, maybe not creating a meal 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 plan for the week, but um, <laughs> can you? How can I use it for my presentation? Right? How can I help it make my talk track better? Or if I'm designing a course, how can I use it to help me outline and script? Um, you know, for any sort of course instruction I might do. And then the last one was really around transformational leadership. You know, how do we get our leaders um, upskilled on this and understand the basics, um, how they should be thinking about this technology and how it impacts the strategy at the business level? Um, and what are the risks and opportunities around it, right? Um, you know, we've heard a lot of talk about the ethics of AI and okay. uh, how can you how can you use AI in an ethical manner? Um, and this pathway, you know, it really is designed to help leaders access that information and then also think about it in many different ways. <clears throat> and I, I think the, you know, the reason that this is critical is even just looking at the use cases, you can immediately see that these use cases impact across your organization and at every level. And I think that point you made earlier, which was, you know, in prior large technology shifts, Oftentimes that may have only hit a smaller population and it might've been your technical or engineering population, right? New languages they had to adopt, new models of operating, you know, moving to the cloud for existence, mm -hmm. right? Like we, I think the rest of us are like, yeah, we understand it. I don't need to actually know how that works, right? Um, but this is the fundamental shift is that every single person whether you're using it daily, whether you're delivering it into your product, every single person has to touch it in some way and how and what they need to know about it is different, right? Mm -hmm. And exactly. so thinking through those use cases and, um, and seeing them just laid out here, I think is super helpful. Um, Eric actually had a question, one of um, which was, where is the best place to start with this dabbling? And are there resources that you recommend and how did you learn it? I feel like that's a great one, especially as you as a practitioner, maybe you can give that lens. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And um, excuse me, our, um, so I'm, I'm in kind of a meta position, right? I'm a learning leader at a learning company on a learning, <laughs> learning team, right? So it's, it's very meta. We talk about learning all the time. Um, but we also treat ourselves as like first customer and do a lot of experimentation and innovation on ourselves. And so back in the spring, we said, you know what? It's clear that ChatGPT is like a thing. We need to pay attention to it. And so we actually designed our own learning experience for our own learning team to help mm -hmm. us upskill, to help us dabble. Um, and we've actually turned that into a toolkit and have shared it like publicly. So I'm happy to share that as part of this call too. Um, that really, I mean, you could literally take it and apply it in your team and any teams in the organization. Um, and it really just helps. It, it's in the spirit of experimentation and dabbling, right? So how do I just explore the tool, um, get to know it, use it in many different ways so that I get just um, that practice, right? So it's one thing to know it. Um, it's another thing to actually apply it. Uh, and so that uh, experience is designed to do both. So I'll, okay. I'll share that for sure. Yeah. You got a lot of, please, please share that. Yeah, yeah happy to. <laughs> Great. Well, look, and I, I think that gets to, uh, oops, sorry about that. Um, that gets to um, one of the points that I think both of us came away with as it relates to leader pro leader development programs and the um relationship with technology is that companies are pouring, you know, trillions of dollars into AI and what you might consider transformation initiatives. But yet there's a lot of data out here and this data is called from, you know, a lot of the top consulting uh, companies such as BCG and others that talk about the fact that a lot of them fail. They might fail short of their objectives 
they might fail in the um, sustainability of those initiatives. And then they might also fail in actually realizing the increase in performance and productivity, as we've talked about, that companies and the leaders and employees themselves really want. Um, and I think we landed on this I, uh, takeaway, really, that, and this is backed by research, that a lot of that oftentimes is because there's a failure around people and change management, right, versus just the delivery of the upskilling themselves. Um, and I thought one of the things I wanted to share was just that really to both of us just led to this um, idea of how critical it is that leader development is a core part of that AI transformation journey for companies. So if you look at um, some of the data that we put up here, I won't go through all of it, but one of the big things that McKinsey pointed out was that transformations where you really are thinking about enabling mindset and behavior changes are then actually much more sustainable and can actually have a much broader impact on financial growth than those that don't, right? And so it means in addition to experimenting and learning the skill, we really have to help our leaders adopt and change their mindsets around adopting change. So also meta maybe, but um, I thought that was important because the challenge and the reality of if you don't do that is, um, you know, back to your idea of helping people understand, well, what's the, what's the challenge if you don't do this? And I think the reality is that there is a much higher probability that your investments in upskilling around AI may not necessarily be a sustainable or have the impact that you want. Any thoughts on that, Becca? Yeah, no, I, I love that you brought that up. And, um, you know, even uh, on an individual level, you know, there's like been varying. Um, I talk to chat, I talk about Gen AI um, a lot with, you know, people like, hey, what are you learning about it? Are you experimenting with it? You know, et cetera. And it's really interesting. You know, you, you uh, will encounter folks that say, never, like, I will never experiment with it. I don't want to use it, mm -hmm. you know, for whatever reason. And, um, I've gotten into some really interesting conversations there too, to like try and understand why, like what, what is it about it? And um, I think you highlight uh, nicely too, in terms of like, well, what is the risk if they don't change? Right. Uh, and you, you hear this rhetoric about um, AI is going to take over our jobs or, you know, we're going to decrease jobs. And, you know, for me, it's like, well, if you're not experimenting with the technology and you don't really understand it, or you don't know the use cases for or how you might apply it, you might lose your job, right? Because you're not quite sure how to transform and how to adapt to that new technology emerging. It's like if you get a new teammate on your team and you're not re-looking at roles, responsibilities, um, workload shift, you know, the whole thing, well then, yeah, like you might be doing redundant or duplicative work. Um, so it, it's kind of the same concept, right? And um, yeah, it's it's really interesting to me. I think that the resistance and then how do you win people around? How do you get them experimenting with it? One thing I heard recently that stuck with me was this uh, phrase, which was, if you look at every major technology shift that has happened, you know, in the history of the world, that one thing that has been consistent has always been first fear and worry about what does that mean and what does that do to our status quo. And yet history also tells us that the ambition of humans and of people is actually unlimited. And that ultimately those technology shifts ended up driving and increasing the ambition and actually the scope and um, opportunity for everybody that could adopt those. And so um, maybe, you know, sort of positioning it in that lens and seeing and um, helping people, like you said, understand the risk, but also pointing back to how actually historically humans are just ambitious. We're resilient. We want to learn and we want to be able to do more. And that that is something that has very consistently repeated itself throughout history as it relates to technology adoption. Mm -hmm. I love that. Well, one thing we are going to shift towards, and I'll start to move this here as we get to the end of this, is really then, you know, 
why is it critical that you think about leader development in this area of Gen AI? And this is going to be related to what we bring to the last segment, which is around coaching and that its role in leader development, is that one, coaching and leader development is going to be extremely powerful and um, impactful as it relates to these types of change management initiatives. I also think that we talked a lot about how risk mitigation and driving retention, helping people sort of translate that into um, understanding how their jobs can continue to evolve, right? Or how they can stay engaged. Um, that's going to be important. And then sudden, uh, certainly, I do think that as you think about leader development, just thinking about how you can create more agile ways for people to think about what capabilities they have to develop in context of these changes is critical and relates to um, particularly the adoption of Gen AI. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to bring it home and we're going to do it pretty quickly. Um, and this is, um, you know, one where Rebecca and I are excited to talk about this because we felt like we've kind of gone from this broad framework of skills then where technologies roles in it. And now we're honing down into leader development and how it kind of, when, when we were preparing for this, we started to see that it actually bridged everything that we talked about. And so uh, Rebecca's gonna talk a little bit about surging skills as it relates to leader development. Um, and we'll dive further into that. Yeah, that sounds good. And and to really kick us off, would love to again, just do a quick to get the sense of where the group is at. Uh, think about leadership skills needed in organization. Um, so you can pick from coaching, team building. Yeah, and Maybe Eric, I don't see I that. Oh, there's the ball. There we go. Um, <laughs> so go ahead and give us a sense of what is most important what's most needed in your organization. And what I was going to say is, Eric, we'll, we actually, I think, will address part of your question in this next session, so. Oh, yes, perfect. Yeah, so Eric's question for those of you who didn't see it, um, how would you partner and use some of these techniques with making sure there's an understanding of empathy? Such an important consideration in any design. I'll be I very curious hard. where this lands. Okay. I know this is a hard choice. Yeah. Coaching. Okay. So 55. So a little over half. Coaching. Um, coaching as um, most needed in the organization. Uh, followed by team building, empathy, resilience, and then other. Uh, so what's super interesting, if you um, want to move mm -hmm. us to the next slide, Christine, is uh we also saw that as um, the top trend in leadership development in our learning trends report this year. So we just published it um, uh, last month. Uh, our learning trends report really focuses on what are what are the surging skills that we're seeing? What's the activity change? You can think of it that way on the platform in terms of um, consumption of learning. And so you'll see these like, you know, 177%, 150%. That gives you a um an idea of how much or like to what degree uh this this particular skill was surging. And so number one for leadership was coaching and developing others, which means a lot of people, a lot of leaders on the platform are going out and seeking content around how do I coach, how do I develop other people. Um, following that was team building and organizational collaboration. The third was empathy and interpersonal skills, which is really interesting. We we saw this for you know the surge of that, um, staying somewhat consistent um, from when like hybrid, uh, you know, kind of really kicked off and came on the map. That that seemed to show up then too. And then lastly, resilience and managing change. Um, so those are really the topics, the skills that we're seeing. And then Christine. Um, you know, you want to share a little bit about the capabilities that Sounding Board um, has and, and how you conceptualize these skills? Yeah. Um, 
So what we often hear, and um, so at Sounding Board, we have a capabilities model that underpins the work we do with leaders, and we take a coaching approach, right, by delivering coaching or enabling those companies to enable internal coaching programs or mentoring programs as well. Um, and this is the part that I think is really interesting because, um, you know, Eric's question was, well, how do you partner and use these techniques? And so what we really try to do is, first thing, is actually name what are those behaviors that would demonstrate that you are increasing your um, safe capability in coaching and developing others, team building, empathy, and resilience, and just exposing that, right? And so one, I think it's very important, and why we spend a lot of time on this is for every company... Some of those might map to how we have that mapped here. Some of that might be distinct for your own organizations as well. But taking time to actually name what are those behaviors so that people can understand. It's not just you telling me I have to be a more empathetic leader, but now you're setting out almost like we were talking about breaking out the skills in a job. You're actually naming what that means and how that would show up for yourself and for others. Um, so that they could recognize that you are, you know, being more empathetic or being more oriented around building your team. Mm. So hopefully what we were hoping that we could do with this was just show that one of these surging skills, what are some ways you can think about how you develop those? And this can give you a little bit of a blueprint even for how you design programs to actually improve or influence changes in these behaviors. The other thing that we thought would be helpful to share was, you know, we also hear a lot, especially now that we've seen, not only does the Udemy data show, but even your own experience has shown that coaching is top of mind, always comes to this question of, well, if I want to develop a coaching culture, how do I do that? And what does that actually mean? Um, and so, um, HCI and the ICF, so the International Coaching Federation, it's a body that sort of um, creates some standards around coaching excellence, um, actually named these. And so we wanted to share, um, similar to how we did with capabilities, what does it actually mean for you to build a coaching culture through your programs or initiatives that you're leading? Um, and what are some of the ways that you might have these as potential outcomes, right, of the programs that are um, initiatives that you're designing. Um, things as basic as actually having budget dedicated to this, thinking about access, um, thinking about um, how and where you're involving leaders in the conversation around coaching. But, you know, the sort of hard and fast rule or the takeaway was thinking about, you know, if you can try to drive towards four or five of these, you're starting to lay very strong foundational groundwork for building a culture of coaching, a, a culture of coaching across the organization. Um, and that is an important part of driving sustainability and consistency to that over time. And the Last thing I'll leave folks with is, and then what's the impact of that? And hopefully this can also be some data that you can bring back into um, your organizations as you look at building programs and learning for next year around some of the ROI and the why of what this can do for the organization. And one of the things that I think is critical um, that I want to highlight um, because it relates to the skills conversation we had as well as technology is that if you can build a coaching culture and bring that into your leader development programs, you actually have an organizations and leaders that are 3x more likely to be able to adapt to change. They're 2x more likely to innovate, um, 2x more likely to delight your customers, and ultimately as it hits the bottom line, much more likely to exceed financial targets. So the data clearly shows, um, and this is a report we put together with Josh Burson, there's actually some great case studies in there around the specific programs, um, a few companies like Intel and ConAgra launch, but it'll give you um, a, an example of how some of 
uh, those companies have designed programs that have driven these types of results. Okay, well, we have actually hit the end of the webinar. I had thought before like, wow, 45 minutes, 50 minutes is long, but it went fast. <laughs> It did go fast. You know, Christy and I, but um, as we, maybe we can take a minute and answer some questions that we didn't, we didn't get to. Um. <clears throat> Thanks to both of you. I appreciate this presentation and just the interactivity, the conversation, um, really fascinating. And I think folks were engaged. Uh, I saw it in the chat. So thank you both for your time today. Eric did uh, have another question here. Do you see companies migrating from a mentoring culture to a coaching culture? Mm, it's a good one. Um, so I think it's a both and. Uh, you know, I think they kind of go hand in hand. Um, I can speak personally at Udemy. Um, we just redesigned our coaching and our mentoring approaches here. And are proud to be sending more co uh, customers and partners. Um, we found that uh, um, actually it's both for us um, because when, uh, you know, coaching the mirror and asking great questions and, um, you know, really helping somebody else find their own path, um, mentoring can be a little bit more directive, right? So it's about somebody who might be further along on that path, that same exact path that you're on and you know, learning from them and really asking um, them to share knowledge and share that expertise with you. Um, and so, uh, you know, we see them go together really well and we like to pair them together and um, have our leaders have both experiences. Um, Christine, I'm curious how you think about it. Um, yeah, um, the thing that I think I would have people focus on is um, where, what's the outcome that you're trying to drive and also what um, skills or connections are you trying to enable, right? Mentoring, in addition to being able to be more directive or maybe be more skills or functionally focused, has this huge benefit of connecting people across your organization. And we know that that's critical, especially as we are talking about hybrid work, folks, distributed work, um, you know, people that are, um, have come in and out of the organization at different times. So I, I'm with you there. It's an and. And I think, um, you know, what we're really trying to forward at Sounding Board is, and how can you bring technology to that equation to make it easier for all of you? Because that's yet another thing that you have to manage. So how can you start to centralize that and think about technology as an enabler for you to allow for these different modalities? Mm -hmm. We have a few minutes left. There was some, there were a couple of questions that came through toward the beginning around a similar theme. So I'm going to uh, just throw these out here and see see what your kind of brief reactions might be. Um, I'm seeing companies actively recruiting more so than actively hiring. Can you speak to that? And I understand that skills-based hiring is a recruitment approach that focuses on skills rather than education or work experience. I assume that doesn't negate the value of past experience. So where do the two meet when hiring? So kind of the, these themes around you know, hiring, recruiting, um, skills versus education and experience. Yeah, I mean, personally, I've noticed that uh, the recruitment talent acquisition world is leading in the skills-based movement. Yeah. Um, because it's skills have been so at the surface of what they're looking for, right? So they're assessing, can somebody do it? Um, it it absolutely doesn't negate your job history, your education, the experiences that you've had. I think the double click into that is from that experience, what have you learned and what can you do as a result of that? So um, it's no longer going to be enough to say, you know, I went to Harvard, it's going to be, okay, you went to Harvard and what have you learned from that experience? What can you do? Um, you know, so it's really, uh, you know, moving past maybe the brand or the caliber that might be associated with, you know, where you went to school or what jobs you've had. And it's creating a more equitable world where we're able to say, you know, instead of starting with that, just starting with what can you do? Um, Christine, I'm curious if you add anything to that or if you have some different points of view. Yeah, I think it fits back into the framework you shared originally, right, around thinking about personas 
And just knowing that you have to integrate a few different layers and that ultimately the impact of that is you should be getting then a better alignment of person to the role, to the skill sets that you need, which will ultimately drive ideally higher success and impact in that role. Um, and so I would really think about um, how do you integrate these different ways, both the traditional ways that we have sourced and found talent and developed talent, but really start to layer in some new thinking around how you can expand that. Because if you can, that actually opens up not only opportunity for those employees or those leaders, but it's going to open up a lot of opportunities for the organization. So there is a sort of double benefit there. For sure. We are at the top of the hour. Any final comments from Chris, from you, Christine and Rebecca? Um, maybe a, a final charge to the audience as we get ready to, to head out. Well, just yes, yes. I, think I wanted to just say thank you to everyone. I really enjoyed this. I hope that you all found it helpful as well. And our goal really was to stir some new thinking and hopefully, you know, help you contemplate a few new lenses as you go into your planning for next year. So thank you. And I hope everybody has a great holidays. <laughs> yes. Thank you all. I, you know, I echo what you said, Christine, thank you and have great holidays. Thank you so much, uh, Christine and Rebecca. Excellent job. Um, and I appreciate the sponsorship by sounding board. Uh, thank you to all the attendees today for your interaction, um, for engaging in this really thoughtful discussion and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. And this concludes today's webinar. We thank you so much for attending. The recording will be available at webcast.td.org. We will send our registrants an email tomorrow with this link. Please be sure to visit our event calendar to sign up for future webinars at webcast.td.org slash events. Have a great day.